Hi, I'm Donna Coletti, a board-certified medical doctor who, after 17 years of training and practicing obstetrics and gynecology, changed my career to palliative care and hospice. Now, as that's not your typical career path, I could understand why you might be thinking, you know, how that happen. And especially if you think of birth being here and serious life-threatening illness being there. So I'm going to ask you to possibly suspend your thoughts of what palliative care is or is not and sit back and allow me to take you on the journey which Andrew Bennett calls the longest journey anyone can take, the 18 inches from their head into their heart. And it all started with this man, my dad, Bob Coletti, who that picture happened to be taken 45 years after he was told he was dying of throat cancer, six months after he was told he was dying of old age, and more than a year before he actually died of diabetes at the age of 86. Now, it's typical for physicians to give an inaccurate prediction of life expectancy because we're not well trained to have these discussions. But what was atypical in Dad's case was how he and our family handled that news and despite never having heard the term, delivered palliative care, namely physical, emotional, psychosocial, spiritual, existential, and practical support, so that despite suffering severe pain, disfigurement, loss of voice, and an unimaginable shift in what he thought his and his family's life was gonna be, overall, he remained a rather happy and content man who was not held back by that gaping hole in his throat or the silence. And in part, it had to do with his basic nature, which was jovial, combined with what I'm told was a loud and boisterous laugh, and what I saw, which was the intention to find meaning and purpose and dignity in whatever he was doing, whether it was related to family, business, or that elusive pursuit of the perfect score of 300 in bowling. You see, the, the choices he made for his medical care were based on quality of life, which is easier said than done, because when you're often choosing for quality, it's at the expense of time. And no example was better at showing that than when he was first diagnosed in 1961 at the age of 38. A securities analyst for Lehman Brothers with a really bright future, he was given the choice of either having the gold standard of surgical removal of his voice box or radiation therapy. Now, being the sole financial support for my mom and four kids under the age of 15, understandably, he was worried that if he lost his voice, he'd lose his job. So he actually chose the radiation, which worked for a couple of years, allowing him to commute to New York to work, to have radiation, then back to Long Island on the Long Island Railroad. But then it didn't work, and he was dying of his tumor and the doctors in St. Luke's gave him another choice. And they said, well, you could have comfort care and you'll die in the next few days. Or you could undergo this risky and experimental surgery tonight, which really gives you no guarantees of survival, but maybe we'll get you a couple of weeks to Thanksgiving. And so because, you know, he was this, Having a young family, he figured, all right, we'll do that and see if we can give him more time. It left him disfigured, mute, being fed by a tube in his nose, and in great pain. But despite that, he managed to communicate really well. He clapped his hands, he snapped his fingers, he wrote things down. You know, even on the phone, rapping out once for yes, twice for no. It was always dad's voice and dad's choice that came through. So in 1985, Dr. Eric Casal noted that in the pursuit of alleviating suffering, medical therapies can often worsen suffering by creating new sources of suffering. Consider medical therapies, medication side effects, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, or simply the amount of energy that it takes to face, endure, and recover from a major surgery when you're already sick and energy depleted. So as predicting life expectancy is really a gestalt and not an exact science, here we are 35 years later, and there are a lot of medical therapies we can do to you. Yet, because of poor training, 
physicians remain woefully inadequate at having these discussions. The researchers Christakis and Lamont have even noted that on average, we really only correct about 20% of the time. 63% of the time, we're overly optimistic. 17% of the time, we're overly pessimistic. Yet these are the predictions that families and patients trust and rely upon so that when we get it wrong, we're creating more suffering based on unrealistic expectations and misguided planning, which is really unfortunate because that makes palliative care inevitably overlap with hospice care. This over-optimism combined with poor physician training leads to late palliative care referrals, which then inevitably are end of life. And that's unfortunate because 1001 Associates have shown that early intervention with palliative care alongside curative therapies in an integrated model of care in advanced cancer patients has shown to not only enhance quality of life, patients fill out more advanced directives, they report being happier, they have less hospitalizations, but on average they actually lived about three months longer. So palliative care is a subspecialty of medicine which is focused on assisting the patient and their families in pain and symptom management as well as determining what goals of care are for that person. It's trying to align their treatments with their goals and all along delivering support for the, pam for the family and for the patient. So it's not just relegated for the elderly or for those with cancer or at end of life. It's really meant for anyone, young or old, at any time, and the earlier the better, when they're facing a serious or life-threatening illness. You may be familiar, actually, with the term supportive care. And that phrase has come about because clinicians and family members are worried that if we use the word palliative, it could take away somebody's hope. Now, you know, you call it what you will, but I feel if clinicians were better trained to have the discussion and open up the emotions of the patients and their families, they'd be better equipped to make choices that were based on meaning and purpose and dignity and lessen suffering rather than just time. Dr. Nuala Kenny has explored that in her book, Rediscovering the Art of Dying, where she talks about our Western culture that's both death-denying and death-defying, and how we've adapted this idea that somehow you can get out of this life alive, and you, know, you really don't have to face these issues. And that's unfortunate, because this attitude has now translated into the inability to deliver quality care to an ever-expanding demographic. In the United States, our US death rate is one person every 12 seconds. 7,000 people die a day, and 10,000 turn 65. So you very well may be part of that silver tsunami, or you may be love or caring for one that lives nearby you. On the other hand, you may be part of the sandwich generation. Those between the ages of 45 and 55 who are now financially caring for both the elderly and the young in their family, leaving very little time or resources for themselves, so that when it comes time to actually physically care for the elderly, that role reversal is debilitating and stressful for everyone. And yet, that was the situation, caring for ill and elderly parents, which revealed to the daughter in me that life isn't linear. It's really what they say in The Lion King. It's the circle of life, with birth and death being that same point on the circle. And it has more similarities than differences because they deal with the emotions of transition. Now, watching the delivery of what I like to call slow medicine in the elderly, or less is more, it revealed to the daughter in me that the medication's often the easy part. It's really the emotions that are gonna derail you, theirs and yours, so that in the Italian family that I grew up in, our emotions were rarely kept to ourselves. It was really important to know what resources were out there that could help you navigate these situations. 
And I was raised in a house where the decorations were part Jesus at the Last Supper and part Snoopy, right? So that underlying messaging to me was always clear, that the struggles in life would always be there, yet it was your choice to remain open to joy. And Dr. Harvey Shokhanov in his book, Dignity Therapy, has explored the ideas and the differences between disease and illness. That the disease is really a biologic process in the body, yet the illness is what allows the person to face and endure and live with their disease because it's based on their belief system and their, um, their culture. So in dad's case, the disease may have taken his voice and temporarily his strength, but it never took his spirit. Having once bowled a 299 before he got sick, he believed he was gonna bowl and live to bowl that 300, and so did we. So that in 2006, when he was given yet another two-week life expectancy, my husband and I said, you know, we're gonna move him to Connecticut from Long Island to our home, and he'll just pass away there peacefully, right? And he even wrote us a letter describing the wall of love that overcame him upon hearing that news. So, 18 months later, when we still were all in that house dealing with the transition of my dad, the hospice nurses had to come to me and say, Dr. Coletti, somebody's going to the emergency room and it's not your dad. You're working all day, you're up all night, and excuse me, everyone's suffering here, which really blew my mind and struck me hard because it meant I had to revoke my pledge but what happened next is what left me speechless because when I went to dad and looked at him and told him this, he just mouthed at me and said, I know that, I've just been waiting for you to figure it out. Because first and foremost, he was always the parent teaching their child how to live and how to die with dignity. After 45 years, he was ready to finally move on and let that wall of love flow back to me and enable me to enter into what Andrew Bennett calls that longest journey, to get out of that surgical mindset of what I had to do to keep him alive, and into that emotional heart space of how I had to feel to let him go. It humanized me. And so, in order to um, appreciate where we're going in, in medicine, the rising acceptance of palliative medicine in collaboration with curative medicine has really allowed us to create an integrative model of care that allows patients and families to find their voice to be able to express these emotions because true support is a combination of both IQ and EQ, right? It's your intellectual quotient aligned with your emotional quotient in a combined collaborative effort to be supportive. And there are a lot of programs out there that can help physicians and clinicians enable themselves to obtain these skills to be able to better communicate and assist patients in exploring these difficult topics. Because what they do is they allow us to not only deliver exemplary care, but establish trust and maintain hope, all the while keeping our resilience so we don't have burnout. So back to dad. About two years after his surgery, he was back riding the train to New York, playing cards and competitively bowling. He, despite his pain, he actually rehabbed himself back to competitive bowling. So that in a tournament in Pittsburgh, he actually bowled a 299 again. It was so close, yet so far. So, in order to keep his focus on dignity and meaning, he took that last pin home and put it on the shelf along with his other bowling trophies. The bowling ball, that had a different fate. In the car and ride on the way home from Pittsburgh, he got to a bridge, he stopped the car, he got out and he threw it into the river. Because after all, it was always his voice and his choice that came through, even if he didn't have a voice. So, what can you do when you are inevitably faced with these really difficult situations? I think the first thing to consider is, have you filled out any advanced directives or are they just sitting in a pile somewhere waiting for that day? 
that you have to do it. Don't wait. Uh, because the one thing in life I've learned is that the only things we can control are love and forgiveness. But it doesn't mean you can't prepare. And there are a lot of non-threatening programs out there to help you do that. There's the website prepare, there's the conversation project or the five wishes, which allows you to get into that emotional heart space with your families and discuss these really tough issues. Because despite a 1990 congressional act that supported advanced directives or living wills, a 2017 retrospective study showed that really only about 37% of people complete them. A 2014 study showed that Americans over 60 did better, about 70% completed them, but sadly it didn't correlate with whether they went back to the hospital or where they died. Something else is going on here other than just filling out paperwork you need to get into that really emotional space. So if you or your family members, like my dad, want to die at home, it means having this discussion with your family and being able to equip them with not just the practical plan, but that emotional plan. Because it's not uncommon for hospice families to not feel emotionally prepared and call 911, derailing the plan that the patient and the family set up. But you can't blame them for that, because Dr. Laura Marston has pointed out that a national poll of clinicians, physicians, showed that 99% felt that advanced care planning was important. 50% said they really wouldn't know what to say. And a third said they never had any training. Right? Another study of oncologists showed that 45% said they'd never had any training. So how could you blame advanced cancer patients when a study of them showed that only 37% said they'd ever had a conversation. So what else can you do? You can ask for palliative care. You can ask for it not just from your doctors, but from your health systems, from your nursing homes, and from your political representatives. Find out what they know about the differences and the similarities between hospice and palliative care are, and whether they support our current Senate bill, which is called Pichetta, or the Palliative Care and Hospice Education and Training Act, because along with the organizations listed on this slide, it works together to be able to provide this essential training for clinicians to be able to then provide a better quality of care for both hospice and palliative care patients. Thank you very much.